Hello there. It's Thursday at noon. I know it is. Do you remember our arrangement? Thursdays at noon on CFUV. Are you ready to get started? What do you have in mind? What I want to do now is called first person plural. You make it sound excessively attractive. That's what I have in mind. One year ago tomorrow, May 9th, the first episode of First Person Plural was aired on CFUV-FM here in Victoria, British Columbia. Today, we celebrate our one-year anniversary by keeping the plural part of the show honest with a panel discussion. First Person Plural is based upon the simple idea that events in our daily lives occur within the context of our relationships to other people. What each of us does is important for his or her own life, but it is also important for the lives of others. We make history together, and as such, our destinies are intertwined with each other. No better example of this beautiful complexity can be made than a community-based approach to health. The biomedical model focuses on diseases contracted by individuals. Health, however, can mean much more than not being sick and can involve much more than individual behavior. Community-based approaches to health and health promotion research regard cultural and social factors to be important to personal health. Development of community resources is as important in this approach as vaccinations and antibiotics are. The members of our panel today are playing important roles in a Victoria-based project in the Hillside Quadra and North Park neighborhoods. Concentrating on the prevention of chronic conditions that tend to start in midlife, that is 35 to 64 years of age, promoting action toward health or a path is a research project that is taking a community-based approach to health issues. In their second year of work, PATH is currently facilitating a community kitchen, community garden, low-impact exercise classes, and community mapping designed to understand community resources and community history. This five-year effort is funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and is as much about research as it is about health promotion. The term community-based research is broadly used and has very degrees of grassroots involvement. The basic principle behind most of the work that uses the term, however, is that information gathering and knowledge production must have some connection with and must give back something to the community being studied. This is easier said than done. Taking this approach becomes a balancing act of the community's needs along with the desire to publish research results and the demands of funding sources used to more traditional models of research. First Person Plural is a show focused on how groups, including communities, are formed and sustained. We are a spoken word show produced on community radio. It seems appropriate on this first anniversary of our show to take some time to think about community and how social research relates to and supports communities. We hope you will enjoy our panel discussion today as we examine community and reflect upon our roles in promoting community in an episode we call when our paths cross. I'd like to thank each of you again for agreeing to be here today. I'd like to start off with each of you telling me your name and what your part of the project entails. Hi, I'm Doug Rhodes. I chair the Hillside Quadra Neighborhood Action Group, and uh, our part of the project is as a community association uh, cooperating with and benefiting from the study. I'm Laura Funk. I'm the research coordinator on the PATH project, and um, my role entails things like uh, d data collection, it, for instance, the survey we did of uh, residents of the community and as well as just some dissemination efforts of that information back to the community and on just ongoing other ongoing data collection throughout the pro project. 
And my name is Debbie Pierce and I'm the community coordinator, which means that I work with individuals and groups in the community to identify what kind of initiatives we might get going to try to improve the health of the community. I've heard the word community already today and it's a very powerful word, I think. I'd like to ask each of you how you would define or describe what community is or how it might be defined or described. Well, community in, in this sense is uh, defined officially by the city according to an area of land, uh, but that's only one way of thinking about a community. Uh, other ways of thinking about it would uh, revolve around people's interests and mutual interests. Um, for example, uh, people in a similar socioeconomic group might have similar needs or similar problems uh, and they might come together to try to solve those problems as a group and that might be a community. And of course today with the, uh, the internet and so on we have virtual communities that have no relationship at all to geography. So as we think about communities, I think we need to go beyond the notion of people who happen to live beside each other or even people who happen to be doing the same things for whatever reasons. And we need to look for some element of uh, commonality or some element of uh, people uh, trying to do something that's bigger than themselves. And as an example, there might be two people who live in the same community, they drive to the same area every day, they suffer the same traffic congestion every day, and they might even have the same response to that. They might be going to a meeting or writing a letter. At that point, I don't think we have community. I think we have parallelism. Uh, for it to become a community, people, uh, I think, would need to recognize that they share with each other some of these concerns and begin to think about how they might work together uh, to address them. So when I think about community, I think about intentionalism. Uh, there needs to be some uh, intent to uh, create something larger than yourself. There needs to be uh, a sense of uh, a common wealth, if you like, that we all contribute to. Uh, and it, it's more than just private people doing what they would have done anyway. Um, and doing it together. One thing that uh, we asked people on the survey was if a, pe a group of people in an area don't um, have a sense of community or a sense of belonging to one another, can you really say that that's a community if they have other similarities? Also we asked people about one thing that came, suggestions that came back where people thought there needed to be more of a sense of community developed in their neighborhood and for them that entailed things like they wanted to get to know their neighbors better and, and have that idea where you and your neighbors look out for one another. That kind of feeling, to me, is a, is a sense of community in a, in a neighborhood or a defined geographic area. Yeah, and I, I agree with what you guys have said, but I also think community is also based on interest. That's kind of what you were talking about, Doug, and there has to be some intentionality there. And that's one of the challenges, I think, of this project, is that we're working within a geographically defined area, but within that there's all sorts of different communities, not just neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. But there's various ethnic communities. There are um, people who don't really have a sense of belonging to a neighborhood community, but they have other communities in their life. I mean, you know, it's not that they're disconnected totally, but they may not be connected to that community. So it's, uh, it, cre it creates a lot of challenges when you're really trying to build community around a, a, a geographic model. Mm -hmm. And, and from a research perspective, perspective, if you're trying to study community, one of the things we've tried to grapple with is how do you define it? And, and for research purposes, you can often only really define it by that geographic thing, which is why I think mm -hmm. a lot of people keep coming back to that. But it's how do you um, gather information on these other communities? Um, I think you need a lot of uh, sort of new and innovative research methods to do that. We've talked about community, I guess, uh, partly uh, having an aspect of things in common, so things that people share, and we've talked a little bit about uh, intention or, or uh, perception, if you like, and people perceiving themselves as part of a community. Um, and I think that brings in uh, a whole question of a public-private uh, split. Uh, the, uh, I'm thinking of the, the recent book that, that came out, it's called something like Bowling Alone, and it's arguing that in America uh, people are less community-spirited and less community-oriented than they once were. Robert Putnam's book. Right, I don't know if that argument uh, you know, will eventually prevail or not, but it's an interesting question that says how, uh, 
wealthy, if I can put it that way, not just in money but in other senses, how uh, wealthy do we feel as a community? Um, to what extent are people prepared to uh, you know, make investments in the common benefit versus private benefit? And if I go back again to a traffic example, there seems to be lots of money to buy fancy cars and SUVs and so on. There seems to be no money to improve the public realm within which those vehicles operate. Uh, so the, the, the spectrum that I'm talking about, I guess, uh, if a community is strong, however it's defined, it is able to mobilize its resources, financial and human and intellectual and social, in order to achieve things um, that are common to everyone. If a community is weak, then private interests will try to achieve their own uh, goals, uh, possibly even to the detriment of, of the rest of the community. So that our group, for example, is defined around some institutional things that relate to zoning and traffic and bylaws and land development, and it's, so it's very geographic in its definition. And yet we recognize that there, as Debbie has said, there are any number of communities that overlap with or operate within our geographic area. And sometimes, Doug, I think you've probably had some experience with this with the Nag Group, is that there are um, sometimes competing interests within communities. Um, there's lots of things that are shared, but there's different. There are different uh, socioeconomic layers within a community. So, if you take social housing, for example, there may be some portion of the community that that advocate for social housing because they can't ever afford to buy a house. They can't even afford to rent. And then there are other groups who can afford to buy who may not want social housing in their backyard because it, they may perceive that it creates traffic problems or there's more kids in the neighborhood than they want to have a, they would if they had single family dwellings and all sorts of other things. So I think part of the challenge of community is how do you balance those interests and how do you bring people together to recognize that in spite of the fact that there are differences, uh, we have to work together if we're going to live in a healthy environment. That's really a good example and, and uh, you know if we think about solving problems in quotes, if someone sees uh, run-down buildings and poor quality of housing as a problem, in quotes, mm -hmm. one solution is to bring in people who have the income and the resources to fix up those buildings and Absolutely. make them nice, yeah. and so so-called gentrification. Mm -hmm. right. So if we focus on the problem being, look at those run-down buildings, uh, we've solved it. If we focus on the problem as being, how do people find a decent way to live in their community, mm -hmm. well, we've just got rid of all those problem people right. yeah. uh, and replace them with others and, and now everyone's happy because their property value is going <laughs> yeah. up or something yeah. but really all we've done is displace. From a community point of view that's more like an immune response mm -hmm. you know to try to get rid of some aspect of the community and I would see that as destructive. Mm -hmm. right. you, know, you know it reduces diversity and, and uh, it makes people feel less welcome and belonging. Yeah. That's some of the tension in the community development literature. Um, and even we found in our survey, a number of people identified, we asked them to identify things they liked and didn't like about their community. And then a lot of them didn't like the more visible, uh, you know, issues of drug use and, and prostitution and that kind of thing. That's an identified concern on the part of people. But from a community development perspective, how do you deal with that? Um, you know, do you if the majority of people want to push these other people out of there, do you go along with that? Or, you know, and, and the, the whole tension between, in community development, some people say you have to de develop a consensus in the community, and then that's, you have to agree upon a goal, and that's, that, to, in my view, is the hardest thing to agree upon, is that that goal and how to how to get there. Other people say, though, that you need that conflict and a lot of discussion, a lot of healthy discussion around the, the issues, um, and that it, it's that conflict that will lead to the more meaningful change. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's what, this may be getting into another area, but that takes a lot of time to do that, yeah. right? And most research projects are not set up to, yeah. with a lot of time to be able to do that. That's what makes ours kind of unique. We yeah. do have some time yeah. to be able to actually work in the community and, and try to build around some of those issues. Yeah. Well, what I'm hearing is that the word itself is informed by a taxonomy, or rather how you define the word drives a taxonomy that in turn informs the research. I want to hit methodology more specifically now. Uh, I'd like to hear from each of you or from all of you collectively a short description of what community research is and how it differs from more traditional traditional in quotes, please, forms of research. How is the methodology driven by this conception of community and how is the method by which the conception is formed influential on the research methodology? I guess the first thing is that community-based research is about community. It's about people, it's about community. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is that the community and the people that live there have to participate in it in an integral way. 
in order for the research to have uh, have value. I'm not quite sure what you mean by traditional research, so I'm going to put my own spin on it. I know you put quotations around that. So I'm kind of thinking about, you know, the usual quantitative approach um, to research. And community-based research is, by and large, qualitative. It may have some quantitative mm-hmm. aspects to it. But it's very different in that it allows you to explore the complexity of community issues and community research, uh, which you can't do when you're simply trying to quantify a problem. It's, it's not possible. Mm-hmm. So it's much broader. Some, when some people use the term community-based research, they mean more of an approach where, if you're talking about, say, health promotion or disease prevention, where researchers will go into the community, and that's their forum for disseminating information to people about health promotion. And that can be a very sort of top-down from a research perspective. They're just using the community as a, almost the, the setting in which they are doing their research. Um, and there's almost a continuum then from the, that kind of, if that you could call that the traditional community-based research. And then at the other end of the continuum is what the community development stuff has informed is kind of a, more of an action research approach. And that's the stuff mm-hmm. that fully and completely involves community members, even in defining what it is they want to research and what they want to change and usually it's it's informed with a change perspective that you there's something in in there that in the community that's an identified thing that that people want to change so yeah. there's sort of and then there's a variety of things that fall in between those two sort of opposite ends of the spectrum you're listening to first person plural on CFUV Victoria's public radio 101.9 FM, 104.3 cable, and on the internet, cfub.uvig.ca. Giving sociology an edge! This is a hard, this is a, it's a difficult area, community-based research. It's hard to remain true to it. Mm-hmm. Because sometimes what you have in mind as the researcher, or even for myself, who's kind of in the middle of it all, right? Um, you have an idea, and you think it's a pretty good idea, but the community doesn't necessarily share that idea. So then you're in a bit of a pickle, right? How do you work with the community so that either they see the wisdom of, of what you're trying to do or you realize the stupidity of what you're trying to do by taking direction from the community. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that um, Doug does is he tries to keep us honest in how we work with the community. So if we profess that we're going to take direction from the community, then Doug reminds us when we aren't. <laughs> or, mm-hmm. you know, he plays that, which is, is exactly what he should be doing as a community member. Well, maybe a more specific question then. How can community research benefit the communities being researched? What kinds of challenges are faced by communities when they are part of these projects? Well, I think there are several uh, and probably pretty obvious benefits that are available to the community. Uh, One of them would be that we're able to learn about ourselves through the expertise and methods that the researchers are bringing. Uh, We may have day-to-day perceptions of what our community is like, uh, but the application of scientific method or the survey information or whatever can tell us uh, quite a number of things that weren't immediately evident. Uh, we referred earlier today to how diverse the community is, and in fact there are different sub-communities, if you want to call it that, within the geographic area of the study and also the area that our group works with. Uh, and again, we might be kind of dimly aware of that, but the research gives us some facts and figures and quantitative as well as qualitative impressions of of what those issues really might be. So the first advantage is that the research tools themselves are illuminating and they help us to learn things about ourselves that we might not otherwise have learned. Um, The second advantage is that to the extent that the researchers are interested in carrying forward projects which we uh, were interested in already, Uh, There's everything from extra sets of hands and that the people on the research team can help us to do things right through to funding and um, if I think about some of the mapping exercises we're doing, we had a demonstration the other day of of some uh, uh, graphical or geographical information system technology Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, it was interesting to me because in the demonstration I think the people were trying to show us from a technician's point of view what this technology did 
but the community folks were all immediately zeroing in on the content in the maps and saying, well, that's not right, or oh, look at that, that's where the school <laughs> is, or, or whatever. So again, yeah. looking, uh, looking at ourselves through a different lens or, or uh, um, seeing ourselves in a different light because of the expertise that people have. Um, so funding, obviously, uh, uh, additional uh, human resources and uh, additional insights would be advantages. Some of the challenges I guess, uh, to some extent, are the mirror images of those in the sense that, um, and it's been mentioned already, that some of what the community's uh, objectives are may be different than the researchers. Um, I think if I, if I think of a more traditional uh, scientific model, if I were studying a community of animals or insects or whatever, uh, there would be a, uh, what was called a top-down approach. Uh, we bring the research protocol to the problem and the subjects really are just uh, um, subjects. There, there's a distance or an alienation between them and the researchers. Well, we don't think of our community as something to be studied. It's where we live and, and you know, the concerns that we have are, are the concerns that, that people have in their daily lives. And to the extent that um, the research methodology or approach um, alienates us from that, that's a challenge. Um, another challenge, I think, is that a lot of the community components of the research are done by volunteers. And they're generally people who have day jobs, and they come to meetings at night, and they're, they're tired, and they have family responsibilities or whatever, and so have quite a different perspective on meetings and outcomes than perhaps people who are paid to participate. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I wouldn't say this about anybody who's present today, but there has been discussion in the past about uh, research-type projects where it seems to be enough to the researchers to have a meeting and have some energy and, and to kind of go away and say, well, that was a fun event. Whereas the community people say, that was three hours out of my life and I had to get someone to take care of my kids or, you know, I, I didn't get my, uh, my paper done that I had to get done for the next day or whatever it was. And so I needed to see some outcome. It, you know, it wasn't enough just to see some community dynamics happening. We want to see some product. And, and so again, that's an example of how the objectives of the people doing the study may differ from the objectives of the people who are just people like anybody else uh, who are participating on a volunteer basis. Um, I guess the, uh, the next thought that I have is, is around um, what are the, the ultimate outcomes for the community. And uh, not to pick on what you said, Demi, but if, if the objectives are different uh, and the measures are, are different, then uh, it's unlikely that the uh, research project will be seen to be a success. Um, so, uh, again... Yeah. Well, I raise that, Doug, actually to, as, as a point of, of, of what you have to work towards in this type of research. You have to come together on that, or else it isn't, you know, just right. the point you made, it isn't going to be a success. You can't ignore that. It's part of the process for the community and the researchers to reach consensus on what it is, if it's really community-driven research. Well, and I think we've talked before <clears throat> about uh, uh, different ideas people had and, and I've tried to bring the community's perspective. You know, how would people respond to the idea? Right. You know, I'm thinking of one where we were, we were talking about, uh, uh, you know, recording and broadcasting some of our meetings, and, mm -hmm. and uh, we always have this tension between um, something to be kind of a neat and cool thing to do for the project, yeah, and thinking, well, what would the response to people be? Um, you know, if, if you're thinking of uh, someone who's at university uh, and then uh, someone rolls in one day and says, I'm going to film the class and broadcast what you've said on the internet or, or whatever, right. yeah. uh, the students are probably going to go, wait a minute, um, this wasn't what I expected and let's talk yeah. about it. Yeah. And people in a community are no different. And right. So as we think about how we want to do data collection or how we want to interact with some of the existing institutions of the community or just wide open public meetings, we always have to think, you know, what does it look like from their point of view? Because they may be people who are quote unquote disadvantaged uh, or challenged or, you know, by definition we wouldn't be doing the study if we yeah. didn't think there was something interesting there. But at the same time, there are people who have individual dignity and concerns mm -hmm. and aren't necessarily interested in uh, um, furthering other people's uh, objectives. Yeah. And you see that's that's really a challenging 
issue for a project of this size, which is community-based, because in a lot of community-based research projects, you have a small group of people mm-hmm. who are really, they're, they're from the community, but they're driving it. So they make the decisions around it. And to, to a certain extent, um, we have that with almost all of our initiatives that we have going on in this project. But as they grow, you're involving more and more people. And those people have different ideas. There's not consensus within the larger group that's developing. So it's, it's, it's quite interesting in how this, uh, how this is all, all going to boil down at the end mm. of the day. Well, can I just add one more point there, Laura? What I was going to, I just wanted to support what you were saying around the researchers uh, not sort of studying the community. I think that's another re- important difference between community-based research and traditional research. Researchers don't try to be objective in this situation. They try to be part of the community. They recognize that it's there's a lot of artificiality around objectivity anyway. But it's clearly part of the methodology to be immersed in the community because that informs the research question, develops a uh, um, more understanding of the context. Mm-hmm. And that relates to what, what I was going to say in the sense that there's there are a lot of tens- tensions even in that faced by researchers because all of the stuff that they normally apply for grants and stuff that requires them to have this very sort of view of research as very objective and very top down and of course the researchers decide what they want to study and so even um, people that are granting projects are just starting to have this other kind of community research involved and they don't always they still sometimes require the researchers to have the very heavily quantitative objective kind of approach to how they evaluate it and so I think some of the granting agencies need to um, take a new perspective if they're going to have, you know, fund community research. Um, also, researchers are often aren't trained, you know, to work with communities in the way that Doug was describing. You have to involve the humans for whom it is a problem. Well, especially for example, because there's such a heavy volunteerism aspect yeah. from mm-hmm. the community point of view. I mean, these are people who don't have to come if they don't want to, so... This type of research is reliant on community members coming out and applying mm-hmm. their time and effort and, and uh, resources. And uh, pretty much the instant that it starts to smell wrong to them, they melt away. Uh, but, yeah. So we, we have to be aware of the human dimension. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV 101.9 FM, Victoria. In the early 70s, of uh, trying to basically impose birth control in India and not understanding why uh, Indian women would not want to take the birth control pill. I mean, they were poor and they wouldn't, they really want to have some control over how many children they had. When in fact, um, what was going on in those communities was because there was a high infant mortality rate and child mortality rate, that um, families really need to have lots of children because they needed children to support the parents and extended family members in their old age. So there's no way that the community women were going to take birth control. I've um, heard that about Indonesia as well. Yeah, mm-hmm. it probably happened in lots of places. You see, you know? the assumption there is that, the, the, if I can be brutally blunt about this, yeah. is that those women didn't know where babies come from, and once we showed them and gave them technology, mm-hmm. it would solve their problem. Yeah. A, we misunderstood what the problem was, as you've said, but yeah. B, we had an incredible arrogance about how much we as the yeah. smart people yeah. knew That's right. and how little the community people knew. Yeah. Uh, the example that makes sense to me is, is smoking. Uh, in our society, who could not know that smoking is dangerous to your health? It's on the cigarette packs, it's all over the media. I think everyone has been exposed to the message. The fact that people continue to smoke in spite of that is not because they don't know it's bad, there must be some other factor. And so if we bring to these research projects the notion that all we have to do is tell people some information and they will change, uh, we may be frustrated. That's a great example because um, there are different approaches one might take with different communities again around smoking. But unless you work with those communities, you have no idea what the solutions might be because you don't understand the problem. For example, 
women. We know, if you look at the problem of smoking with women with a gender lens and involve women in the discussion about why it is they continue to smoke, there's all sorts of other issues for women. There's issues around body image and weight loss and there's a whole other dimension there. So you might apply a totally different kind of strategy to try to encourage women to quit smoking than you would with men. But unless you involve women in that discussion, unless you become <laughs> immersed as part of the community uh, to understand it, you're not going to get those answers. Well, and you know, the PATH project being focused on health, many of the things that we're trying to do uh, through the project uh, relate to encouraging people in midlife to change their behavior patterns, mm -hmm. not because they're particularly ill now, but because their health in later life will be profoundly affected. And smoking is yeah. one, diabetes mm -hmm. is another. Yeah. Just getting people out walking two or three times a week, uh, you know, would improve their health. That's right. But again, uh, do people know they should exercise more, eat less, and not smoke? I think they know that. Right. And so we need to get to much more fundamental kinds of, of issues. And mm -hmm. we, we hear people say, well, if only there was a safe place to walk, I would go walking. Well, for a, uh, that's great, and we should build those chip trails, but we should not be surprised if they aren't filled with people uh, you know, the day that they open, yeah. mm -hmm. because there's undoubtedly something else going on. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. People talk about, I don't go walking because I'm afraid of crime, and then we go and get the stats, and we find out that we don't really have very much crime. We have a lot of fear of crime, but we yes. don't have very much crime. And so again, it's the solution to reduce the crime statistics and get more police. Well, it turns out that the complaints I hear through the Neighborhood Association, when we do get additional police uh, attention, is that it's interpreted the wrong way. It's not, oh, I'm glad to see that police car, uh, I feel safer now. It's seeing the police car as evidence of how dangerous it is in my mm -hmm. neighborhood, and so I'm definitely not going to go out. Mm -hmm. So again, we're dealing with some phenomena here, uh, which are part of a matrix that comes from larger society and the media, and I don't know where of factors that, that we have to get at. And um, another example is we have a, a very difficult uh, place uh, right at the edge of our neighborhood, a motel that's used as a center for drug dealing and, and criminal activity. And one of the ideas was that we get a neighborhood crew together and go and paint the place because it looks bad. Uh, it was an outsider who had that idea. The neighborhood immediately said, well, that makes no sense at all to us. Uh, we had uh, right-wingers who said, that's private property and I wouldn't want someone coming to my house and repainting <laughs> it without my permission. And we had left-wingers who said, that's not going to solve the problem. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a fundamental environmental uh, sociological kind of problem and a coat of paint can't address it. Uh, but everybody uh, immediately uh, reacted negatively uh, because it was treating a symptom mm -hmm. and not a fundamental problem. And if people were shooting up in that motel, uh, they would continue to do so if it had a new coat of paint on the outside mm -hmm. because they weren't uh, doing it because it looked tacky. Right. And we often see these kinds of quote-unquote good ideas. Um, we, uh, I think, have talked before about the, the urban renewal and construction of a major traffic artery through our neighborhood that happened oh, 40 years ago. And the scars are still there. And when we hold public meetings and talk about neighborhood history and, and, uh, and the future, uh, people talk about that to this day, uh, mm -hmm. and the irony of it is that the some of the facilities created through that have not succeeded. The school, for example, it was built is a, is likely to be closed, and we had this huge empty area in the middle of the neighborhood, created by people who undoubtedly had the best of intentions at the time, to solve the problems that the neighborhood had, when in fact it it uh, damaged and hurt the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, to the point where 40 years later people sit in rooms and talk about yep. uh, you know, <laughs> how bad true. that was. So all these things have kind of a theme, I suppose, that, that people are trying to apply the tools they know, um, regardless of whether it's a good fit. Uh, people are treating symptoms instead of fundamental causes, uh, and uh, arguably it all comes from not understanding what the underlying uh, fabric, if you like, of the community is, and therefore imposing things from mm -hmm. the outside or top down that that not only don't solve the problem, and sometimes they actually create more harm than good. Mm -hmm. the, there's a lot of really complex thing, complex issues, um, which just reminded me again of, of how hard it is to do research with communities because of all the issues involved in the, the you know, the different interests in the community and that kind of thing. Um, but for me, I mean, even though it's really hard for researchers to do this kind of work and for communities to do this kind of work, um, it's not a reason for researchers to stay away by any means from a health promotion perspective as well. I mean, 
if you're going to try and tackle those root causes of, you know, unhealthy lifestyles or ill health, the, the socioeconomic and the, uh, the broader determinants of health, then you have to do that with communities. You have to do that in the context. So you have to do this research and you have to, if you're going to have any effect on health as a health promoter, you have to work with communities. So it's, you know, even though it's hard, <laughs> I think it's just something that, that has to be done. I mean, that's the only route to, to change, I think. Well, I really agree, and I, I think you know the, the history that we have of, of sort of urban planning and design is is a history of optimism that if we could we can design our way out of social problems, mm -hmm. and that somehow uh, you know some of the problems that communities have uh, relate to the, the physical and built environment. And there's no question that that improvements can be helpful yeah. and they they can have an influence, uh, but uh, but they're not fundamental. And the kinds of things, Laura, that you're talking about which are much more difficult to research, being more fundamental, ultimately have a lot more leverage probably to deal with some of these issues than, mm -hmm. as I say, uh, uh, you know, if you want people to walk more, make more trip trails and they'll get out and walk and run, well, maybe they will, maybe they mm -hmm. won't. We need to understand the problem more deeply mm -hmm. than that. Mm -hmm. After a time, objectivism has done all it can do. And at that point, it has two choices. It can turn it over to other methodologies, or it can simply assert that there can be no other methodologies? Well, well I, you know, I don't, uh, I, I don't want to give the impression that, that uh, the so-called scientific method isn't useful. Earlier on I was saying one of the benefits of the community is to see ourselves through uh, different lenses, mm -hmm. and these tools can be helpful. Um, and I think of it as, as uh, you know, if you're trying to solve a problem with your automobile, you logically break out the different systems and you do an analytical approach, you're probably going to find out that the carburetor is flawed and get it fixed. The problem that we're facing is that human communities are vastly more complex mm -hmm. than, than an automobile. And using only that analytical method um, is not going to get us where we want to go. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater mm -hmm. here. There definitely is some value in the uh, objective and, and quantitative approach. It's just that we don't want to stop there. We need to, to do more. Yeah. You need different methods for different purposes. Right. And I would say that there is a scientific method involved in qualitative research. It's just not a positivistic a different, a different one, kind, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it's, you know, it's methodological. It's a method. There's, there's, um, there's a process that you go through. There are steps. It's just mm -hmm. there are different kinds of steps and it involves reflection and, and uh, um, you know, re-looking at what you've done and constantly changing it. There's, you know, with the positivistic approach, here's point A and you get to point B and you figure out what caused the, the, uh, the reaction in the middle. But um, with community-based research, that's, that's, that's not the method, right? You look at what you've done, you recognize that what you've done is going to ha have some effect uh, on what you're trying to change and then you change your method to make it more useful and so on and so forth. Well, I'd like to thank you again for coming today. It's been uh, very pleasant speaking with you about these issues. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, thanks uh, for inviting us. You're listening to First Person Plural, your source for soothing sounds of sociological sagaciousness. The police state is using... It's phallocentric organ, the corporate media, to control ordinary people like you and me. We'd like to thank everyone who tuned in to First Person Plural during our first year of broadcast. Hard to believe it's been a year. Yes, but it has. Well, nearly so. A day short of a year. We've enjoyed doing this show up to a point. There's a kind of creative tension between us. Creative? Yeah, I think so, don't you? Yeah, I would say so. I think we work well together, if that's what you mean. Yeah. And I've had a lot of people tell me that that's the charm of the show, that it's obvious that you and I are simpatico, in, that we talk in about a, these... In a tense kind of way. <laughs> yeah, in an entertaining sort of way. <laughs> we have a share of action scenes, is probably the best way to put it. Pow, pow. Pow, pow. <laughs> <laughs> Whap. Biff. Boy, Batman. I can't believe we got out of that one. Holy crap, Batman. <laughs> of course, my voice keeps getting going away, which sort of isn't cool when you do a radio show. No, in fact, it's fatal. That's true. Maybe you should switch over to video full time. That way you can just show up and look pretty, and that would be the end of your obligations. <laughs> Aside from the off-screen work. 
uh, I think my brains are more important than my beauty is the problem. Well, no, I one. wouldn't say that. <laughs> well, you're um, biased. So let's talk about the last year. Okay. What have you enjoyed most about doing first person plural? I've enjoyed a lot of different things about it, so it's really hard to pick out just one. The fact that we use such a variegated approach is one of the things that I like about it, which is a cop-out answer, but it's my answer. I've gotten to talk to a lot of really interesting people, pick their brains, and I found that enjoyable. I've gotten to look into a lot of issues in depth that you just don't find in the popular media, and I found that gratifying. And I've gotten to spend a lot of time sitting around a table almost exactly like this one, <laughs> speaking to you about these issues. Which is something that we were doing before we did the radio show, but now we get to record it. Yeah. In fact, we did a radio show before this one, an internet radio show. It was called Coffee Shop, and we did that for a little bit over a year, did 30 episodes of that. And it consisted of us going to a coffee shop, turning on a cheap tape recorder, and just recording our conversations onto normal bias cassettes. And that was the show. We just came up with a different seed topic each time and talked about that for a while, and then meandered, and perhaps meandered back, and perhaps didn't. And that was Coffee Shop. It was predictably well-regarded by the critics and completely ignored by the public. Predictably. Yeah, let's hope that doesn't become the story of our lives. <laughs> Critically acclaimed. Impoverished. Yeah, let's, uh, let's hope we're cut out for better things than that. I think we are. What have you enjoyed about this show? Let's turn the question around. Well, I've actually enjoyed the production of it more than the being on the air part of it. I think that's one of the ways that you and I complement each other. I've done a lot of good writing in the last year. You've done a lot of excellent writing in the last year. Yeah, and I've enjoyed bringing concepts together that I don't think other people would necessarily bring together. So that's been fun. And I like I like writing the... Uh, I don't do all the writing for the show, let me make that clear. But the writing that I do for the show, I've really enjoyed. And I've enjoyed learning how to edit. I've learned an awful lot about how sound works and how editing works, and I've not always been very good at it. I've sort of learned a lot by trial and error, but what's community radio if it isn't full of trial and error? <laughs> I wonder how atypical we are in that we pre-record most of our show each week. I think we probably are pretty atypical. But I'm glad we did it the way we did because I think that our ultimate direction is not to become radio broadcasters, which makes us a little bit different as well. Our ultimate direction, I think, is going to be multimedia production. And it will probably end up on film more than on audio alone. And the pre-recording of the audio and learning how to edit and move things in and out and that kind of thing has been great preliminary practice on a lot less of a budget than editing for film. And we are finding, for those of you who don't realize this, but we're in the process of learning how to do film. We're kind of learning it informally on our own, again with practice making perfect. But we are finding it much easier to pick up on editing of digital film after having edited digital sound. So I'm really glad that we did it the way we did, even though we didn't plan it that way. Yeah, it's been a good forum for practice, if nothing else. They keep telling us, well, you have to start somewhere. We went yeah. from tape recording a conversation and caring only if it was intelligible to a much higher level of production. Yes, but it wasn't just the production. It was also the idea that I was on the air. And while I knew I was on the air, so to speak, on the internet, I also had a good idea of how many people were and were not listening. And we were having conversations that we already had. We just had a tape recorder on. We weren't trying anything new or anything different other than we just stuck a tape recorder in between us. In other words, we've been, we've been going for coffee and having long talks about the world ever since we've known each other, the 12 years that we've lived together. Sure, absolutely. That was not anything big or new. They putting something together in a creative way for the radio show and then being on the air and not really knowing who's listening and who isn't and sort of being shocked every time I hear that somebody is. It, it made me nervous. I mean, I had jitters. I still get a little bit of jitters. And well, I mean, one of the reasons that we started pre-recording was because I had such jitters that I didn't think I could do it live. And it kind of felt good to be a novice in, in a weird sort of way. It made me feel like there's still stuff out there to learn. And the show hasn't been 100% pre-recorded. I've done live voice breaks more often than not. 
uh, keeping people up to date about our website, that sort of thing. And I've enjoyed that. And last minute things too. There have been sure some things that it seemed important to talk about. And uh, we didn't know that when we were pre-recording. Have you enjoyed doing the website? You yes. seem to get something out oh, of yeah, it. Oh, yeah, that's another thing is that I've, I like doing website development. Uh-huh. And, yeah, I mean, I'm really not anywhere near an expert at it. I'm heavily dependent upon... Web in a box? <laughs> yeah, web in a box. That's good. I was going to say babysitting web. But, yeah, so I'm I'm not, you know, I'm doing very well with that, with those constraints. But I know of people who can take things and do far more than I can do. Having said that, I've really enjoyed doing it. And I've really enjoyed the response to it. You know, people pick up on it. I get an email from people who read things and are interested from that perspective. So it already is multimedia. I mean, even before we added the film, we were doing multimedia because of the website presence. That's right. I think, uh, as to your skills, I think you have the single most important skill necessary of a webmeister or maestress. Maestress? My, my German's a little <laughs> weak. Um, and that is the willingness to update the site once in a while. I prefer web diva. I'm sure you do. <laughs> But there are any number of people who put up a website and never update it again. And yeah. whenever I see a website that hasn't obviously been updated within the last year, I think dead site, and I lose interest. Well, and we do. We have weekly visitors. We have people who visit weekly to check out, because I change it every week. You've been tracking it, haven't you? You're using Nedstat, is that correct? Yeah, I think that's the name of the program. What can you tell using Nedstat? I want to make sure that people don't think that we know where they live and what kind of cars they Oh, no, they you drive. can't know that. You can tell who... I mean, some people have their own domain name, so they're pretty easy to mark because when they show up from their own domain name, I know who they are. Um, but there are other people who use university domain names, so I've got a general idea of who they are, too. Sure. Because I know of different people who are at different universities. So I suspect when I see a university name that it is somebody from that university that I know. That's not necessarily true. It tells you the country of origin, which is really interesting because we've been visited by over 35 different countries. Of course, the name of our website is Cultural Construction Company. And I have a suspicion that we get traffic from people who are looking to build things. Yeah, I think the emails I've received asking me about buying scrap lumber suffice to prove that. Yeah, we're I'd on... i call that a sufficient argument in and of itself. We're on a few uh, developer web lists and that kind of thing. So we get interesting junk mail. <laughs> uh, uh-huh. Yeah. <clears throat> the way that it works, I've got markers on more than one web page. So I can tell the people who just visit the front index page and don't go anywhere and people who are negotiating through the website. And from that information, I can figure out whether or not people are really coming to read and visit or they're just hitting it and finding out that it indeed is not a, a construction company. So it doesn't tell me a lot, but it tells me some. There's also a thing that tells me where it got linked from. Like I run a blog um, called Fatty Patties, and I had a... Well, give the URL. Go ahead and give the URL. Sure, yeah. It's um, Fatty, F-A-T-T-Y... Yeah, spell it out. P-A-T-T-I-E-S dot blogspot, that's B-L-O-G-S-P-O-T dot com. Or you can go to Cultural Construction Company and look at the table of contents and link to it from there. And Fatty Patties gets the most traffic because blogs get more traffic than anybody else. Um, in personal web pages, and because it belongs to several different um, web rings, that kind of thing. But I had a spike a couple of weeks ago, like almost twice as much as usual traffic on a particular day, and I couldn't figure out why. I mean, that usually means that somebody's referring to the page somewhere. Well, yeah, that's automatic, isn't it? It's yeah. It's necessarily the case, isn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, you're being linked by somebody else, is what I mean. That somebody's written about you, and they've put a link up to your web page. That's, that's usually what a spike in traffic means. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean, as opposed to a random occurrence. Right. Got it. But I couldn't figure out how to tell... And then I discovered that Nedstat actually will tell you where people linked from. And when I found that out, I actually was able to trace it back and found where um, one of my favorite websites called Alas A Blog. Um, That's A-L-A-S, A-L-A-S, comma, A Blog, who is a cartoonist. He's a really great art 
cartoonist. He goes by the handle Ampersand. He's one of my favorite writers on the net. And I was so excited because he actually put on his um, blog that he was reading everything on my website. So apparently we're mutual fans. Well, that's great. So. It's always good to know that somebody's impressed. I suppose I was being annoyed earlier by critical acclaim in the absence of popular acclaim, but I admit that having neither would bother me a great deal more. But we also have been linked by two or three other web pages on permanent links uh, to Cultural Construction Company. So some like-minded people. Um, there's a website called whywork.org, which gets into discussions of how to define work and how to define what is meaningful work. And they've linked to our manifesto. You know, slowly but surely we're getting a presence on the web, and I really like that presence. I think, though, that we've what we've got to do in the next year, as long as we're doing the anniversary thing and thinking... Um, out loud, as it were, about past and future, is I think the next step for us is to find projects that actually pay. And I'm more hopeful about that with video than I am with radio. Our listeners at home may be curious about exactly how well this pays. This project is not paying us a dime. We're doing it essentially on a negative budget. The, inter- the radio station has let us make use of some of their equipment, which we found to be extremely helpful. But we've had to cover a lot of expenses ourselves, and we're not getting any revenue. I've done a little poking around as to what exactly one can do to feed oneself in spoken word radio in Canada. My best guess at this time is that you're either working for the CBC or Radio Canada, or you're not getting paid. That it's almost that simple. Or you're doing some sort of popular drivel that shows up on commercial radio and you pretty well sell your soul. So we're talking about soulful employment as well as lucrative. We're talking about something suitable for a college graduate. Yeah. And killing time between commercials was not what I had in mind. Yep. Fill in the news holes. The news holes? Yeah. That's a J word, isn't it? Yes, that's a J word that just basically means that newspapers get laid out. Um, The first thing that gets laid out in a newspaper is the ads. Yes, that's right, the advertisements. And then... (laughs) And then... This this look is meant to uh, convey surprise. And it does, in a facetious sort of sarcastic (laughs) way. (laughs) Anyway, so then after that, the things that bring people to the newspaper are laid out. The regular features, such as the comics and the ongoing bridge tips and the Dear Abbeys or whatever it is in Canada. That kind of thing gets laid out next. And then after all of these things have been laid out, they figure out how much news they're going to tell you. So newspaper is actually a huge misnomer. I can confirm this from my personal experience. Uh, I was looking for a job when I was much younger with this sports paper in Florida where we lived for entirely too long. And I contacted one of the two guys who was in charge of the paper and he said, oh, we just concern ourselves with selling advertising. If there's any room left over, then uh, one of us just writes something to fill it in. That's not verbatim, but that was essentially it. It was that the sports writing was comparatively trivial. And after that, it's a filler. why, Why would you hire anybody to do that? Yeah. It was, oh, no, that's not something for which one gets paid. No, no. That's something one does after the work is finished. (laughs) After the real work. Our goal this year is to find some ways to make our lives more sustainable instead of just filling news holes and instead of doing wonderful things on community radio. I mean, having lived in a country where community radio is pretty well gone and is pretty well whatever's left or what semblance of it is left is pretty corporate oriented. I really appreciate community radio in Canada and I've been very happy to have it available to us. Um, But it is obvious that it can't go on forever. But we are going to try to do first person plural this year. I don't want to leave the impression that the experiment is over. No, this is not our farewell episode or anything like that. Yeah, we're going to slow down a little bit over the summer. So you'll hear some reruns. If there's something that you missed that you'd love to hear again, you can email us at fpp at culturalconstructioncompany.com. And we'll be happy to, uh, well, we'll be happy to get any kind of feedback. And we'll most likely honor any requests that you make (laughs) from that feedback. But yeah, we'd be willing to um, 
to offer up reruns on request. Let's go over the URLs and the emails again. Sure. The email is fpp at culturalconstructioncompany.com. The page for the show, first person plural, is fpp.culturalconstructioncompany.com. Yeah, let's make it clear that Cultural Construction Company is all one word, no spaces in between it. And you have to write out company. No fair writing CO and leaving it at that. That's not going to work. The page for Cultural Construction Company itself is www.culturalconstructioncompany.com. You could have figured that one out, but why not make it official? And Patty's given you her blog URL once already. She may as well give it to you again. It's Fatty Patties. That's F-A-T-T-Y P-A-T-T-I-E-S dot blogspot dot com. And that's how you get in contact with us and otherwise check up with us when we're not actually on the air. So here's to us and to another year of first person plural. Yeah, here's to it. You have been listening to First Person Plural, because how people get along with each other still matters. First Person Plural is a show created for community radio by Carl Wilkerson and Dr. Patty Thomas to examine social and organizational issues. Music for First Person Plural is performed, composed, and produced by Carl Wilkerson, except where noted. For more information about First Person Plural, Dr. Patty Thomas, or Carl Wilkerson, Visit our website, www.culturalconstructioncompany.com, or email us at fpp at culturalconstructioncompany.com.